take one third of the game to keep what worked well, another third of the game to fix the stuff that was broken, didn't work properly, and <coughs> with that little chunk that's left, that's where you do the new, the new stuff, the innovation, the stuff you put in the back of the box when you're talking about actual box products in a store of the old school model. Um, the problem is when you, when you use too much of the, the circle, too many, like two thirds of it to do brand new stuff, people are, get totally overwhelmed and don't know what to do with themselves. Okay. Funny story behind this one as well. Uh, basically, I went from a, I did a lot of play testing, and I went from play, a game for The Sims, which was a much older crowd, to a game for kids, and I got the same uh, snacks. And there was this one kid who had so much chocolate, he was like flying all over the place. <laughs> His parents were not very happy with me. Anyway, good lesson learned for me. Okay. So play testing. This is about the importance of play testing. Um, it's extremely important, especially uh, if you have the traditional publishing model where the players don't interact with your game until the very end, when either it's on the shelf of the store or you have a demo beforehand, but that's, that's too late to get feedback and actually do anything about it. So the way to get feedback from players is to get, get them in and play the game and see how they react. And you get feedback on two levels. One is they fill out a questionnaire and you see kind of the trends of things that, are, that they like, things that they don't like, things that they're confused about. But the best thing, even better than that, was actually having members of the team, especially game designers, in the room watching the players play and interact with the game. Because they do things that you didn't expect, they have difficulties that you didn't think that would be a problem for them. Um, and it's, it's important to see your, your representative audience playing the game and seeing, actually interacting with it and answering some of the questions that you weren't sure about in your head. So, the idea here is that you make many, many assumptions. Here's what players will like as you make the game. And so playtesting is a way to answer those assumptions, whether it's what you thought or not, and then you act on that based on the information that you get. Do you also prioritize that in production? Like, do you create the stuff that you need to do playtesting as early as possible? Or do you still have a traditional pipeline uh, where? Well, I think that they have it in parallel. There are some people that, that bake it into the, it really varies studio by studio, company by company. Some people actually bake it into, here at this date we're going to play this. Other people say we're going to need to do it. This person's in charge of it. Just make sure we have them, enough of them to get good feedback. Okay, so these are some of the games that were very, very, very helpful for getting uh, playtest info. These are some of the playtests that I was involved in. Um, okay, let me go to kind of the second part of that. And this is about understanding your target audience. Now, I think in, in a talking about the traditional model. Traditionally in the game industry, it was most of the people who started working in this industry were men between 20 and 35, something like that. And so they, they made games that they would want to play. And that's why we see all the space marines and the orcs and, and the, the same kind of stuff over and over and over again. But the idea is, if you're making a game for yourself, which is how the industry started out, then all the assumptions you make are probably going to be pretty good. Here's what I like. I'm making a game for people who are just like me. If I think this is going to be cool, it'll probably be one, a pretty good decision. When you start making games for kids, for women, for different groups who are not like you, you can't just make that assumption. And a lot of game developers still do that. Well, I think that the, the level of difficulty is good, so we don't want to make it too easy for the player. Well, what if the player is 10 years old and they don't have the same dexterity? They need to have it a little bit easier. So it's important to remember, you're making a game for them, not just for yourself. And again, the more different and diverse the audiences are for the games, the more important it is to remember that the the, the person who's going to buy the game and play the game, their opinion is more important than this. Okay. Um, of course, today when you talk about mobile games and social games, we have analytics. So some people think, okay, well, I have the information. I see what players are doing. I don't have to guess. I can say, well, they're buying this or they're, they're playing less or playing more. I don't need to really do playtesting because I understand, I, I see, top list, here's what people are doing. And that's kind of right. The problem is that if you have just data, there are ways to interpret the data. And you can interpret it by the players are playing less because A or because B, but understanding your audience better gives you more of an insight as to why the numbers are going up or the numbers are going down, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a combination of Shilu Fushnam, understanding who your audience is, who you're making the game for, and then looking at the numbers and bringing those two together, that's understanding. Okay. The other thing about uh, analytics, I've worked with some people who are so in love with numbers and surveys that they will design by survey. They'll ask people, what things do you like? Okay, let's make something based on that. And that's 
it's okay to do A-B testing after the fact. Here are the two decisions we made. Let's see what people like one or the other with this type of drive the decisions of what to make in the first place. To me, that's a mistake. And Steve Jobs agreed. <laughs> Okay, so this is a story. Okay, so this, this is to me more of an organizational thing. Uh, I don't know how helpful it is, but I wanted to bitch about it a little bit, so I hope you don't mind. It's a fun story. Okay, so I'm proud of having worked for EA. Tremendous people there. Uh, not everybody, but a lot of good people, smart people, talented people. Um, this is a little bit about motivation and about having leadership of the company make sure to put people in a position to succeed. Uh, and when you see that the company is not going in the right direction, it's very hard to get the same motivation uh, up every day. Okay, so here are some of the, the projects that were affected by this story about the Several years in a row, after we would successfully ship a game, we finish in uh, June, uh, beta, and in July, we would ship it and so that it would be ready in the stores for Christmas. And then shortly after that, we'd start a new project. And, and unlike today's uh, games as a service where you just keep doing the same thing over and over again and putting out new updates and new content, you got to forget about the old project and do a brand new thing. And it was kind of a breath of fresh air. Yay, let's do something different, unless maybe it's a sequel. But still, you could fix the things that were wrong about the game. And it was a great sense of satisfaction. The problem is that when you work at this time at EA, at the studio I was at, you had lead, corporate leadership kept on changing their minds every few weeks or a couple months. And so they say, okay, everybody's gonna work on this. And everybody kind of run in that direction and you'd get the team all motivated, yay, we're gonna do it, we're gonna make the best uh, Tonka game ever, the Hasbro toy, or Battleship, or Monopoly, or whatever it was. And people would get excited and really put their heart and soul into it and try to be as creative as possible. And you'd really think you'd have something. We're on a way to do something interesting, nobody's ever done it before, but it's still viable for the market that we're doing it for. And then you get an announcement one day, eh, it turns out, forget about all that, we're doing something totally different. And everybody said, okay, let's go in the other direction. And then they'd take a little bit longer to get motivated and get excited and get their creativity fired up, but then they would do that. And then two and a half weeks later, a similar thing would happen. And this happened about four years in a row. And so at the same time, and what happens at the end, they finally make the decision in January, February, March, for a game that has to be finished in June and July. And then you have half the time you had, instead of making, having eight months to put toward a game to make it polished and deep enough and interesting enough, you have four months. And that happened many, many, many times. Uh, games that we got out that had no business being finished on time, were finished on time, but, and we're proud of having done it, but the, the product wasn't at the level it should have been. Uh, that was all because of the management couldn't make up their mind about which way we were going. And often, the place we ended up was where a lot of people thought we'd start out in the first place. Okay. Um, communication and one-page design. I was at a GDC 2010. Uh, one of the things that is, is a, a legitimate problem for game companies is communication. And I can't tell the number, I can't say the number of times that I've had People on the team who are making the game have no idea what game they're making. They understand generally, okay, I'm doing this code for this kind of mechanic, or I'm doing this kind of art for these characters or this environment, but I don't understand the whole picture. I don't really know what we're doing here. Uh, and that happens a tremendous amount. So I was at this talk uh, given by uh, a game designer at EA named Stone Brandy, and he was talking about taking the game design and basically distilling it down to one page saying, here's what the game is all about, or here's what this part of the game is all about. So people can understand this is this was a strategy game, this was from uh, Spore, talking about different kinds of how the different uh, characters interact with each other, how, how this is over time, a player should get to this level by this time, and the different paths that they, they could take. But instead of having someone read a 100-page design document, you give them one sheet of paper or two sheets of paper, and it's much easier in one snapshot to understand, oh, I get it, this is what we so for me, and here's some examples when he worked on the Simpsons game as well, it showed in each environment um, the quickie mark or the different places, here is what, what players can do. Now my reaction was, <laughs> because I had to do the exact same thing a couple of years earlier than the previous year, and instead of, I wish I had seen that talk first, because it would have been a huge help for me. 
So again, working on the sequel to her, working on, sorry, working on this game, uh, I tried to, okay, let's get an idea of what everything is. So the yellow, uh, the, the blue ones were movies, and this one, this showed the, the leaderboard, and some others were battles. For example, I tried to color code, okay, what, let me zoom out and see what I'm looking at. And it really wasn't very efficient and, and not great. So then I moved to uh, Visio, and I tried to see what is the path, and how is it going to work. And that was okay, but not great, and not very pretty. And then I went to ooh, colorful Visio, really the same kind of thing. And then I took a look at, at uh, this uh, piece of concept art for for the game. And this is after our pivot, and then we moved to a first-person shooter with mini games. And I realized, hey, there's an octagon in the middle there. And it turns out there's an octagon in Visio. So for here, it helped me kind of start saying, here is what an environment looks like, and then we can kind of zoom in and see, here are the weapons, here are the players, here's what you unlock, here's the, the way things go, uh, the progression. And so that was helpful, it was pretty good. And then by the time the sequel came out, I took a piece of concept art, and this was a lot easier. Now it actually fits, shows uh, visually, here's the progression, here's what happens on level one, here are the weapons, here are the characters, here's new features that are getting introduced, the difficulty, et cetera, et cetera. So this was very, very helpful. We put this big thing up on the wall. Uh, I would update it every once in a while. This was very helpful for team communication because nobody could say they didn't know what we were working on. Okay, <laughs> personal relationships. Extremely, extremely important. Um, and this is also my way to get my Sims story in there. Um, so right now, these days, uh, the Sims, EA Salt Lake did a, lot, a bunch of Sims games. Uh, mostly PC and expansion packs, and now they're working on mobile games. Uh, but it wasn't always the case. So there had to be a first game, and that was the game that I went for. And that was this game, Sims 3 for, for PS3 and Xbox 360. We, they, took, they ported the PC game to console. But it wasn't just a port, they wanted to do something new and interesting and fun. And that was karma powers, where you could basically, these are power-ups where you could either give your people awesome, cool, luck, and fun things, or you could totally screw with them and make them move. Both fun. Mm -hmm. um, and so this was supposed to be done by Maxis, the, the kind of EA studio. And it turns out they had so many problems porting the PC version over to console that they needed, they couldn't do it. So either it was going to be the same old boring game that, that came, same old game that came out from that point that came out on PC, or they could do this, but they wouldn't be able to get it done on time. So they had to call in kind of a, a uh, special fire firefighting team to put out the fire and get things done, and that was my team. So we got called in and we got given this assignment to, to come up in like three months to come fit, design and create Karma Power. This was the, we knew it was going to be the focus of this huge $30 million marketing campaign, and it was a tremendous amount of pressure. The CEO kept on looking over our shoulder, is it ready, what's new, what's the update? Sorry, what's oh, ready? $30 million. Oh. So there was pressure. <laughs> it, turns out, it turns out the people at the, at the Maxis studio were not really fans of ours. They, they were kind of pissed off. Well, who are these freaking guys? This is our game, we're Maxis, we make the Sims. This is the coolest thing about the game. Who the hell are they to take our cool, awesome thing and make it? Maybe they suck. Maybe they're not good. Maybe they're not creative enough. Maybe they can't get another level of quality. And they were pissed. So this is how we started our relationship. Hey, how you doing? You know, great. We're assholes because we took your game away from you. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we had to get to know them. It was not easy. But one of the main things I did was I, I had my team focus on the work, focus on fixing problems that were problems for them and problems for us, get to know each other as much as possible outside the office, have dinner or do things together, activities for the team. And little by little, they also saw that we didn't suck, we weren't idiots, and we actually had good ideas, and we cared about the Sims brand and wanted to keep it at a high level, to which uh, everyone was accustomed. And little by little, we repaired the relationship, and everything was fine, and we worked together, and we did a job that, again, should not have been done on time. We worked into the night, long hours, helping each other with, with, with different parts of the project. We finished uh, Karma Powers, uh, early, and we're able to help pitch in and make sure some of the other issues of the project were fixed on time. Okay, so this is the stage. Can we turn off the light? Show the middle. This is the trailer for Sims 3. Let me jump through because, let me jump through just to the comment part because I'm not sure how much time I have. Okay.
Feature uh, that worked out very well, but it would not have happened had we not prepared those relationships. Uh, these are two other games where I was the um, external producer. I worked with teams who were outside the studio, which I'm sure everyone who works with developers in Ukraine, for example, understands what that's all about. Um, and these would not have been done on time had I not had good relationships with the teams that I worked with. I made sure to go there, take the team out to dinner, get to know them a little bit. There was a team in Canada, and we talked about hockey and whatever. Whatever it is, it doesn't have to be bullshit. You should try to actually care about it and get to know people. Uh, but because of that, okay, here's what we agreed to, and this is what's going to happen. But yeah, come on, let's try to get this done. Also. Uh, give it a shot. So I, I wasn't the kind of person who was going to shove and push and make them scared. But I wanted them to, the teams to, to want them to get it done because we had a good relationship and to get them to care about the product as much as I cared about the product. So again, also about personal relationships. Please tell me people get the reference here. Thank you very much. Uh, again, one-on-one. -on -one. Now, some uh, companies do that a little bit differently here in Israel where, where you have to do, uh, it's basically, each week you sit down, here's what you did, here's what was good, here's what was bad. At EA it's a little bit different where it's more the, the people who report to you, it's their time. So you can, they can talk about their career, how, what they want to do to advance, and you can certainly give them feedback if there are issues. They can also talk about, it's their time to use if they want, uh, of course, you, you need to give them feedback along the way about how they're doing on the project, but this is kind of their time to talk and feel like they had a place to, they, they, they actually had a place to, to release what they needed to talk about. And I thought that was very, it was crucial. Everybody had their own uh, way of doing that. There was one guy who was really ambitious, I mean, wanted a promotion, but he deserved a promotion, but on the EA's official list of what you need to do, he was missing one thing, so we worked together to make sure that that worked out, and he got the promotion, and that was great. There was another guy who hated talking, so I, I, every week I'd say, hey, it's your time, you want to come, great, no pressure, and he never talked, except one time in the entire year, but he knew it was there. So, you know, you don't have to force it on people, but it worked with, with the, each person's personality. Okay, uh, post -mortems. So. It's the name of the, the, my talk today, but also a lot of people do them. After you finish the game, okay, let's talk about what worked and what didn't. And in theory, they're great, um, but you actually have to do something about it. Because if you just say, here's what worked and here's what didn't, let's start with a brand new project. Within a week and a half, you forget what you learned from the last one, and you repeat the same mistake. So a lot of times, what, what we used to do was we would take, okay, here are our learnings, and we, it was the whole process we went through. Here are our learnings, and now we need to make like a team contract, essentially. We are going to make sure to do these things and not fall into the same pitfalls, and the whole team would get around it and agree to it. And any time there was an issue, we'd go back and discuss it, and we fixed the issue by making it a part of the new team, and not just something we're supposed to do in the previous project. Did you have a means to transfer this information to the rest of the company? To make a review, if you have some conclusions from one game, I'm assuming someone else might that was a very standard, good, it's a good question. And actually, the people who came to help us with the postmortems came from a different EA studio. Um, but there was not much knowledge transfer as far as the way EA was, even despite their reputation of buying companies and then destroying them, they uh, <laughs> even when I got there about making sure if this is what works for your team, for the most part, they'll let you do that. So there wasn't there was some cross learning, but not as much as that was like. Give your players unexpected moments of delight. Now, I used to have one of the, the, the you know, whatever comics about the guy with the, the rainbow coming out of his mouth looking, looking at something awesome. But it turns out I wanted to put this on because this was... Really, 
was drawn by two uh, EA creative director and a, and a game designer while we were sitting at a meeting at EA, so it has a little personal touch for me. Uh, but the idea that instead of just giving them something that they expect, if they're playing the game and then something awesome happens and it's, it delights them, oh my god, this is the best thing, the coolest thing ever, it's the kind of thing they share with other people. And it makes them feel great about playing the game. It's not just, I expect it to be good, it was good, you know, whatever. Uh, when you surprise people uh, with something that is awesome, then it makes an impact. So, here is, on the, this was a game for, let me get back real quick. This was one that makes me very sad. This is a game we worked on with a very kind of a very small team. Uh, with a very cool idea behind it. Essentially being what I call a third person hunter. Where you control a certain animal, and you're basically going around a certain, uh, whether it's a, a field or woods or whatever it is, and then you're trying, if the rabbit is trying to escape from everybody, you eat the <coughs> and the fox is trying to eat the bird and the rabbit. There's, it's essentially a strategy game hunting real time. And we had very little budget for it. We had a small team for it. We worked on an external developer that wasn't very good, but still we worked together, worked our asses off, and tried to make, to make something as good as possible. And everybody who played at the game, played at the game loved it. Kids, adults, whoever. This was a case where marketing, because we didn't, our studio didn't have a very strong one-on-one -on -one relationship with marketing, relationships again, they decided they really had no idea who to market it to. They didn't think there was a market there. So even though we were done and EA released an official trailer, which I'm about to show you, uh, it actually never got released. And that makes me very sad. So here is the trailer. It was completely done, it just wasn't released? It was done, but to the level of quality that we could do given the time and budget that they, the time they gave. It would have been much better and we wanted more time to improve it, but it's still very good and fun. Mm. I don't want to play it. Don't ask me when I'll get to do it in the forest, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> No, no. We had play tests and people were yelling and shouting and laughing and it was amazing. <laughs> I don't see the little unexpected moment of delight at the end yeah. that the guy could come out of. So that kind of thing. It's just fun and memorable and makes for a great experience. Do you have an Edward Snowden? What's that? Edward Snowden? So this one, uh, if anybody heard me talk this morning, I talked to Hebrews, I'm giving my little unexpected moment of delight uh, away. Mm -hmm. But uh, I also, again, I did a few years ago, I was in the city, I was in the city, and I was in the city, and I was in the city, and I was to get my idea across, but I was in the city, and 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 I was at the end, I just want to show you a little fun uh, video. This is from testing. A lot of weird, funny, crazy things happen. First, you see where where we call them. Uh, that's the name. Wait, what? what? Uh, I see just went to zero. That's where she went by. Mm. Here's the Jedi baby pickup. This stuff happens all the time. So these are bugs that happen over and over and over and over. I don't think you should have fixed it. <laughs> it's a feature! It's a feature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, full stroke, full stroke your baby. Uh, uh, anyway, so this is my contact info. Uh, as I said, I just started uh, my own consulting firm a couple uh, weeks ago. Uh, feel free to, it doesn't have to be about that, feel free to get in touch. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Choose what they want. So, okay, I'll, let me do this piece of crap and then you're here to get free. Surely they won't choose the shitty one. They chose the shitty one. <laughs> so, what happens is, so when you see the ones, we had a picture of a Lil John who's a rapper. I don't know who cares about hip hop. Uh, and so, we had, I had an amazing uh, team uh, of artists and engineers coming up with really amazing creative designs for, for the front end. And we had like 20 of them, and they were freaking amazing. And then there was one that was okay. And then they said, oh, let's stick a picture of Lil John. And then they showed them to Def Jam, who was our licensing partner. And they said, ooh, Lil John, we like him. Let's pick that one. 
We could have stuck his freaking picture on any one of the awesome ones. We put it on the mediocre one, and that's what they chose because they're stupid. And we should have said, let's put the logo on one that doesn't suck as much. But even, even though it wasn't as good as the others, it was still very cool. Just some little things like that, the things you don't forget from your time in the day. Uh, question four. Yes. Uh, what do you think about the future of game development and crowdfunding? Holy shit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, okay. Let's talk afterwards. It's up in, uh... What about, Look, uh, you're gonna have triple A games with huge budgets that are that's you know you're not gonna get fifty million dollars from Kickstarter. Although you had the double fine who got what three <laughs> have you heard million of the stars? Hey, yeah. yeah. I did not, thank you. Teach me what tell me what I missed. Fifty fifty million dollars from so the guy bought, bought the spaceship in the game for two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Yeah. Something like that. He wanted the money. Oh, okay. I don't see that as something that's going to be part of a new trend. I mean, that's, that's a, you have something that has massive, massive popularity. It's possible, but but to get that level of funding, could be wrong. That's my nature. Also, what's your take on longevity uh, and added value of certain games? Because, like you mentioned, uh, EA usually abandons games behind. You know, maybe an update there, small feature, if any. Do you think that you know, really uh, investing in a game, uh, paying the community, providing them the tools to maybe make your game uh, more accessible than the you know, mods and SDKs? EA was never huge into modding. There was, they were very much more protective of their IP. And the thing about EA, even before I left the company Israel, is they started, instead of saying, okay, we're going to put up 50 games in this year and we're going to invest X amount in each marketing campaign, we're going to put 22 games and we're going to invest you know, five times as much in this game, three times as much in this game, and totally get away, remove like half of the products. And that, that would happen. So it's becoming a much, much more uh, hit-driven industry. Either you have a game that's one of the top five or ten, or else forget about it. it makes, it's not even worth the, the time and money to invest in the development process. That is the way that, is the way that uh, EA was on. And many of the Activision, of course, and they just you know, they pumped out Guitar Hero until they killed it. Uh, you know, they did it properly. It was another reason why, for me, the, the, the sequel to Nerf didn't sell as well as the first game. The first game was, oh, we, we did it in like three months, and again, we were making this third person, stupid third person shooter, and we turned it into a first person minigame, which wasn't bad, but it, the reason people bought it was because of the novelty, and kids had a shooter to play where there was no blood. The game itself was okay. We made the, the next game was much, much, much better, but it sold less because the same same guy who kept changing his mind every year and screwing us up as far as our schedule, he's the guy who said, hey, let's make Nerf every single year. Now, what's the difference between a, 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 a group of passionate gamers who actually have careers and have money to spend and their primary thing they want to do is, is play games versus kids whose parents do it who don't get sick of a game after like two months, they, they will play the same game over and over and over again. There was no reason to make the same, a similar game the, the next year. We should have waited at least another year. And had we done that, I think it would have been much better. I don't know where that question started, but that's where I got it. Shela, beivri, tefshar? Can, tefshar. How many qualities do you need to be a good friend of EA? Strong stomach. <laughs> uh, EA is such a different company depending on where you work, which, which studio you work in, what franchise you're working on. Even though they have they have a brand new CEO, Andrew Wilson, who came from EA Sports and started last year, a much younger guy. Um, it depends. You have to be really, really good. You have to be um, smart. You have to be able to work with other people. Biggest thing, especially if you're on engineering, engineering, in the engineering side or production, you have to be able to solve problems. Problems always come up. There's always something that gets screwed up. You have to be able to, to work together to find the best solution possible. Uh, whether it, okay, you have, uh, as I was saying something else before, you have, okay, this is A, we want the shiny unicorn pony, whatever, and this is what we want. Okay, we can't have that, well, can we have it without the horn, or can we have it without the colors, or whatever? Try to find a way to get it as much as you want, and not just give up and say, well, if we can't do it, then I guess, or I guess we're done, and we can't do it. Try to find creative ways to find solutions, whether it's engineering, or art, or putting teams and working on different things. It's everybody working creatively together to solve a problem together. Mm -hmm. uh, because there, there will always happen. When you come up with complex um, software, entertainment software, there will always be problems. The question is how you solve them. There's no, there's, I can't think of a perfect project ever. Can you guys? It doesn't happen. So how, how you solve problems, how you prioritize, and how you deal with things when the shit hits the fan, 
uh, that's the key. But you have to come up with, you have to come into it with talent and, and intelligence and the ability to work with other people. My mm -hmm. project is perfect. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> my project is perfect. It's my baby. Okay, so come up here next to uh, Unconference and tell them about your web. Come in. I'm not sure. Team building, you mentioned. Do's yeah. and don'ts. Something. Uh, I think team building can be different depending on the type of team you have, the type of people you have. If you have a really cynical team, then doing the kind of, hey, rah, 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 yeah. that will probably fail. But if you have people who are kind of young and, 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 and motivated, and, then, then that actually can work fine. It really depends on knowing your audience, knowing who they are and what they'll respond to. Now, it doesn't mean if because they're cynical, you have to do a cynical activity. You just push them just a little bit and find a way to get people to work together and to get to know each other a little bit outside of work. Um, but a lot of it is just knowing who your audience is. So for example, one of the things that I worked on after the second Nerf game, I, one of the things I did as a producer was I, I organized the, the after party, the shipping party. And so half of the people were sports fans and wanted to go rent a skybox at the Utah Jazz basketball game. And the other half hated sports and didn't want to do that at all. In the end, we rented the Skybox, but we made sure to bring, we brought the Guitar Hero, and we got some other games that we set up on the TVs inside the Skybox, so other people had things to do as well. Balancing out, you're never going to make everybody happy, but try to find ways to, to understand what their personality is and do things that they'll actually like. And then other, other teams did poker and paintball, your typical team that they Could you talk a little bit about your career path in terms of how you reached being a producer? Because you said you were in some sort of QA and yeah. start. I don't know, I'm like way over time, but it's an interesting story, I'm happy to share it. I, I got, okay, okay, I am. So, <laughs> we're all doing that. Daniel, you can keep one talking. One thing I want to tell is, I'm, I'm basically should be after you, but there is nobody after me. So, okay. if you want to keep it up until... It's okay, okay. Uh, if you want to keep up until two, and then... Okay, no okay so, yeah, 15 minutes. It, I don't know if it's going to help, but it, I think it's interesting. I've been told it's interesting. Paper um, okay, so I graduated with, with, with an MBA. First, after I came back from the Army 20 years ago, I was very uh, idealistic, and I worked for a couple of Israel-related organizations. I worked for ACAC, who is the, I don't know if you guys know, it's the lobbying organization in Washington. They lobby Congress and senators to have legislation that's, that's favorable to Israel. And then I worked for Abu uh, Dhabi Hayat in Chicago, where we were bringing like, the Israeli general sometimes and help raise money for the soldiers and things like that. And at a certain point, I realized, wow, I'm not going to be able to raise a family in nonprofit. I need to actually do something that's going to make enough money. And so I went to business school. And then I graduated business school. I was going to go into internet marketing. And just as I was about to graduate, the, uh, a little bit uh, before that, the internet bubble burst. And 90% of the jobs that were out there completely disappeared. And so I had a really crappy job working in sales for a company that sold boxes for like cereal and crackers. <laughs> I mean, I'd wake up in the morning miserable. And I'm going to sell the crap today. I'm going to sell boxes today. And then at a certain point, I, got, I had a back injury about a year into the job. And so I realized I was about to have surgery on my back. And I realized I'm going to have a very, very long recovery. I don't want to take a year or two years or whatever and then get back, yay, I'm healthy again, back to selling freaking boxes. I did not want that. So I said, what do I like? What's fun? What's exciting? But actually a legitimate industry. So first I thought maybe I would go be a musician with a drummer and a singer, so maybe I'll do that as a career. Turns out that doing like jingles and voiceovers was a dying industry and everybody's licensing music, so that wasn't going to work. What else do I love? Video games. It turns out, at that time, the, the industry was growing and growing and growing. I just never had the imagination to think about, maybe I could actually get paid for doing this. I never had the imagination to do it. So I decided that's what I want to do. Uh, I start, actually, I started immersing myself in learning about the industry and about design, a little bit about uh, engineering that I learned about the I learned it from working with people. I uh, learned about the history of the industry, and then I actually got a job teaching video game history uh, as a college course. So I ended up learning so much about it. Based on that, I was able to do it E3. And based on that, I started, uh, I actually started a blog about writing, playing games, uh, sorry, about video games for kids, good video games for kids. Because when I was injured, I couldn't bring my kids to the park, but we could play games together. And it helped us, it was a good bonding experience, and I got to know my kids better, and it also helped me learn games. And through that, I got a job writing for different websites, for IGN and AOL. And based on that, I went to um, 
I went to E3 again, and actually I went to GDC, and then I went to E3 the next year as a, as a columnist. I was actually covering these games, and the people that were presented to me were producers, which is what I wanted to do. And I ended up basically uh, getting my foot in the door at EA Chicago. I just networked and networked and networked, and I finally shoved my way in the door. And I said, I don't care what it is, I'll start at the bottom. And I had a family, whatever. So okay, you'll be a dev tester. Great. Dev tester, fine, but within two months I was a producer, and then kind of... Okay, I'm just, no more questions. If you want to talk about my side, I think we'll make more fun.